Okay, friends, I want to continue. I'll finish a little bit of uh, explanation about the, <clears throat> the practice of developing the insight and impermanence and also uh, the no-self, which are the you know, primary insights that one develops when practicing the insight meditation. And so this morning we're, you know, I explained about the uh, process of impermanence and uh, that uh, it really the deeper aspect of it refers to observing how quickly the mental process, you know, arises and vanishes. And also how that's, you know, connected with, you know, the production of, of karma and, uh, you know, keeping the habits and sankaras in our mind, uh, you know, strong and keeping them uh, generating. And then also how we can gradually uh, reverse uh, that process to you know, attain uh, liberation, which is the ultimate you know, goal of the Dhamma teachings, freeing our mind from you know, greed, hatred, and delusion, and especially being imprisoned by uh, our, our own ego. <clears throat> so I mentioned the simile of uh, the, the, the mind moments and the of a, a, a motion picture reel. How what we call our world is basically just moments of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking uh, that are arising and vanishing uh, very fast. And uh, so, somebody gave me a statistic. What oh, oh no, somebody gave me a statistic. They looked it up on Google. <laughs> I mean, the cells in the human body, something like 37 trillion, trillion. 
I only thought it was a billion. Science has got something up on me. Anyway, <laughs> it's even more inconceivable, you know, how many times per second, <laughs> or, and that's a different thing, but uh, how many cells in the body. So when people say, I can't feel the body, that seems kind of strange. <laughs> You know, except when they stub their toe or cut their finger or get a belly ache, get a toothache. <clears throat> anyway. So how many of you uh, in your meditation are starting to uh, be able to feel more of those uh, sensations uh, kind of more easier now when you, when you sit down? I mean, and they're always there. And... It's just that we've been oblivious to it. No one ever told us really to do that, right? So, it, you know, it's all a matter of uh, you know, training uh, the mind. But anyway, I wanted to go over part of the uh, uh, Paticca Samuppada because there was a, I think a question about the Paticca Samuppada that people that had. Now, you know, it's tw the 12 links of dependent or origination. A lot of people have difficulty, you know, remembering those 12, 12 links. But <clears throat> basically, the first two, ignorance and the karma formations, are the things that we brought with us from a past life. You know, when we were, we were born into this life, basically the ignorance that we had in the past, as well as the karmic accumulations, which are the sankaras, uh, we kind of brought that uh, with us. Uh, and because of that, depending on those ignorance and the sankaras, and in this new, new life, as the baby uh, grows up, as I mentioned, the ignorance is, is coming back in. And, uh, you know, when the ego is formed, and then there's the contact, uh, feeling, craving, grasping, and becoming. So anyway, th those, the, the contact, feeling, craving, grasping, and becoming, and even birth, these are the things that we can pretty much observe in our experience. We're kind of, uh, I mean, and especially what are uh, important in our practice of meditation and how we can, uh, you know, reverse the process of negative uh, accumulation of the, or called negative becoming. I hope it's not too confusing for you. And I think everyone has heard of the Paticca Samuppada, right? Or dependent origination. So the contacts, you know, we've just been talking about that, or the, the moments of s s impressions striking our senses. Sight, sound, smells, taste, touch, and, uh, and thoughts coming from within. So the five physical senses, and then the mind is considered its own sense, that means the memory, and the impressions that are in the unconscious, and they keep, you know, coming up all the time, and we can cognize. Uh, <clears throat> like a dream. How many people have dreams once in a while? Or every night? Well, that, that's a sankara that's arising in your mind. <clears throat> as well as all of our other thoughts and emotions. So we have these contacts and they're producing feelings. That means the pleasant and painful and neutral feelings. But the most important ones that are creating our karma are the painful and the pleasant ones. Those are the ones we uh, overtly kind of react to with desire or aversion. And we can feel those too. So it's in the meditation, 
you know, when you have gotten that, uh, you know, centered the mind there in the breathing body, because that, that's where all those things are occurring. You know, all those things are coming through the nervous system. All the senses are tied into the nervous system that, uh, you know, go along the spine to the brain and produce the consciousness. And so, especially the, the, the painful ones are probably the easiest things to observe. When you're meditating and, you know, you, you can feel a lot of even minor irritations. Like, you know, and there, it causes a contraction in the, in the nervous system. You know, like when you hear a sound, a big sound, how sometimes you jump like that. Well, even the body... Anytime any little irritation uh, arises, it may not cause a big jump like that, but uh, in the subtle nervous system, there is this kind of contraction. And if you're concentrated, you can notice it. Uh, and usually it just it arises and vanishes very quickly. Uh, but then because the mind then identifies that particular sensation and says, that's a pain in my knee. And now we're reacting to the, the thought in our mind and not, not, no longer reacting to the actual sensation uh, that's continually changing. We're actually, you know, we're reacting to this concept that's in the mind of a body, this pain being a body and this body belonging to uh, me. And it's the me that has all of its self-preservation in it. And it's uh, trying to, you know, always have comfort and happiness. So any slight little irritation with a little itchy feeling or, uh, you know, just any kind of irritation uh, <clears throat> causes that reaction. And so to observe them uh, and to really see that, is you know a deep level of uh, awareness, and they're occurring all the time, but usually our awareness is not concentrated enough to really uh, see see it clearly. Or if we do, we simply react. So <clears throat> that feeling produces the craving, which is either desire or aversion. Two types of craving, positive craving, that means you want the object, negative craving where you want to get away from, from the object. And, and then there's craving produces what? Grasping. Grasping or clinging, yeah. Upadana. Now, upadana is more important than craving. Because upadana is the mind that grasps that object and then struggles with it. Or grasp it and say, yes, I have to have that. My life depends on that. Or I have to get rid of that. That's going to kill me. And it justifies itself. So grasping actually are the many thoughts about it. The craving just uh, triggers off a, a kind of a instinctual or like that. But then we, we grab that, the mind grasps that and turns it into the big bag boogeyman or Santa Claus or whatever, you know, <laughs> wanting or to get away from. And then builds a world around. That's the grasping. And then that lead that can go on longer, much longer than, than the craving. Craving is just an initial moment. If you don't react to it, it vanishes and nothing is, is carried over. But because we're not able to do that, that initial <coughs> uh, craving or desire turns into uh, the grasping. And then it... Uh, at some point, you have to make a decision, right? What to do about it, right? You're thinking about some object, right? Either desire or aversion. Then you, you have to make a decision. What are you going to do? 
Let's say if you're really thirsty on a hot day and you notice an unpleasant feeling in the throat, and then you see this desire, desire to you know, drink something to alleviate that. And you could just say, well, okay, you can wait a while, you know, and it's no big deal. And then you may forget about it, keep on meditating. But if it's strong enough, you say, no, I, I must have that now. Now, how am I going to get that? I'm, I'm, I'm in meditation. Bhante Rahul is looking at me. How am I going to sneak away? <laughs> you know, I have to go to the bathroom. Wow, that's my excuse. <laughs> so, you know, the mind comes up with all these melodramas. And so on. that's the grasping of the mind. But anyway, it comes up to a point. Now you, you can decide to, to do it or not to do it. Well, let's take a simpler example, an itch. You know, the itch on the, you see that aversion and you want to do it. You can contemplate. This is where you got to contemplate. Well, if I script that itch, okay, it's an itch. So big deal. It's not going to kill me. Now, if I scratch it, I'm going to increase that sankara of, of aversion. If I don't scratch it, I can gradually develop a sort of a, you know, be able to tolerate it a lot longer and I don't have to waste my energy scratching. So all this goes on through the mind, you know, like a fraction of a second. You know, that's going on. Uh, but that's where the Dhamma is important. Because if you take the sight of Dhamma, no, I'm not going to scratch that itch. I'm not going to move. Then you weaken that habit. But if you, you give in and you scratch it, then you increase the, the aversion. I don't know, you all, you all with me? You all on the same thing? Losing anybody? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so the becoming actually is the strengthening of the habit. The strengthening of the sankara is the becoming. And it's called becoming because it's the fresh fuel to cause it to occur again in the future. Because these are just basically electromagnetic circuits going on between the brain and the nervous system. Uh, <clears throat> and so they, every time you repeat something, it, it makes it stronger. And every time you refrain from repeating it, you kind of weak it, weaken it to a certain extent. We've gotten up to becoming what's next? Birth. What is birth? Well, I was already born. Birth arises each moment. That means the ego is born again because you strengthened it. I got rid of that itch. Ah, good. I'm victorious. I got that object of my desire. I got away from that thing I didn't like. So that strengthens the sense of I. And so the I will come up in the next moment. Again, it's reborn. That's what we call a birth in the Dhamma language. Again, as I mentioned in the, in the Dhamma, there's always two levels of everything in the Dhamma. So birth is one, okay, birth of a baby, okay? That's the external Dhamma. But the internal birth is the birth of the next mental state because of the, uh, especially the birth of the self. The feeling of I is strengthened each time you satisfy your desire or uh, you got rid of something you didn't want. And everything, every time you kind of deny it through with wisdom, you weaken it. And so, the, so that whole process, uh, you know, it's happening basically every moment of, you know, the mental process. Uh, so can anybody repeat that? So 
that that process of the Paticca Samapada is probably the most important. And then once you're born again, that means you're going to encounter suffering again. <clears throat> so this is the way we, that we have to study and use Paticca Samapada, especially when you're meditating. But even in the daily life, you can see a lot of that happening. We can notice when our mind is grasping onto something, then you make a decision to do it. You, you could have done it or not to do it, but you make a decision, and then you can see the result, right? You decide, okay, I'm going to tell that back, maybe you. And then you worry about <laughs> at night, so you're going to get caught, and we won't find out. And if you didn't tell the lie, then you see how the mind has nothing to worry about. So these are directly, this is, uh, you know, Diti Dhamma, directly visible Dhamma. You know, and how you can contemplate, you know, the, especially like the Paticca Samapada, which most people think is a really deep, deep doctrine. And it is, but actually, if you just observe your mind, you can see those steps. <clears throat> so... Again, this is all part of the uh, developing what is called the Dhamma Vichaya, the, the investigation of Dhamma. And it's also part of uh, right thought, you know, second step of the Eightfold Path, right? Thought means thinking of Dhamma. <clears throat> so the, <clears throat> but now I want to focus on the craving and the grasping and the becoming uh, more closely. So normally in the Buddhist teaching, what is this, what's the second noble truth? What's the cause of suffering according to the normal uh, translation? Craving, yeah, tanha. Sometimes Tanha is called the thirst. Uh, don't worry about craving. Worry about becoming or grasping. You can't do anything about craving until you attain Sotapanna or what's returning. What we what we do, what you can actually do is you you reduce the grasping because it's the grasping that leads to the actual action. The craving is just that initial little impulse. Like, you know, okay, you, you feel a, a dry throat. You have the desire, uh, you know, be good to you know, drink something, have a cold Dr. Pepper or something. You know, so it's just a thought, an innocent little thought. And if you just ignore it, it disappears. And nothing happens. But if you grasp that, it comes back again. You say, yeah, it would be nice, wouldn't it, Dr. Pepper or Pepsi or whatever you're attached to. <laughs> you start thinking about as I already mentioned, that example, right? So that's the grasping. Or scratching an itch. Or thinking about a sound that, you know, happened outside. Being angry with somebody who making noise. Uh, and so you can see those thoughts about it. And, and that's what leads to the actual committing of, of the comic action or the becoming. So, you know, don't worry about too much about craving. But it's really the grasping and the becoming that is what creates uh, the karma. <clears throat> and keeps the mind locked in its in its habits. So that that link, the transition between craving and grasping, that is probably the most critical point to observe, you know, in the Patichas Hamapada. Because that really is again the it's the craving the, the you know the grasping that leads to the uh, actual karmic action. It is the karmic action that is the karma. <clears throat> and that uh, keeps perpetuating, you know, the habits. But 
probably even because you can't do anything really about uh, feeling. Feeling is going to come. Feeling is a result of, and even craving is the result of past karma. And you really can't do anything about it. They're going to come. But the grasping is what you can observe because it's a longer process. And you can usually see how you, uh, you know, you deliberate even if it's for a second or two, even with that little itch, you can deliberate, am I going to scratch it or not? Am I going to open my eyes or not? And you can do it or not. And then you, you see, you can see that clearly. But, but the craving actually is a very deep, uh, uh, you know, kind of urge coming from the unconscious that we can't really uh, easily see. Uh, I mean, we can, but uh, usually the reaction is so quick. So, and also craving, any uh, poly experts here? With uh, especially like the 10, the 10 fetters the four stages of enlightenment. Anybody heard of those? Daso Samojin, Ten Fetri. I know there's lots of lists <laughs> within the Theravada tradition. But it says that the craving and aversion of uh, greed and hatred are only, are not even uh, affected by attaining stream entry. And, and uh, they're only attenuated or reduced, you know, let's say 75, 80%, even with once returning. So even a never returner, which is a, a very high level, still has, you know, subtle uh, uh, sense, desire, and aversion. So that's what I'm getting at. This is whether you understand that or not now. You know, intellectually or not, but at, you know, if if you understand that uh, uh, you know explanation, then you see how craving uh, is only eradicated by attaining those higher stages. For the, so, for the normal person, even up to a, a sotapanna, you have mindfulness, and you, you know you can you can manage it, but it's not the you know, uh, you know, it may not be that strong, but still it's, it's uh, there. So that's why I, I say don't worry too much about uh, craving in the beginning, because it's really the grasping that causes us uh, you know, so much mental agitation, you know, you know, worrying and guilt, worry, remorse and fear because we, you know, did unskillful things. And, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so these are all, you know, aspects of what is called the, you know, the development of, of wisdom. And there's three levels of wisdom <clears throat> or right understanding. So right understanding is the first step of the Noble Eightfold Path. And it has, there's three levels of understanding. First one is the intellectual level. If you have never heard Dhamma before and you read something about the Four Noble Truths, or about meditation, and you, you know, you kind of get excited about it. Oh, this is something new. That's what it is, you know. Haven't heard this before, and, you know, kind of pricks your interest want to study more. <clears throat> but it's, you know, basically just, you know, intellectual from reading a book or hearing a talk. But then as you get, you start meditating, and you start kind of trying to observe how strong you know, the craving is in the mind, and you reflect back on all the things you did when you were younger out of, you know, attachment, aversion, egotism, you can see the suffering that it caused. So you, you, you can start to understand like the you know, karma and, and how you know, wound up your mind is. So that's no more intellectual. That is a 
a direct you know, a kind of observation. So that's called the wisdom of, or chintamaya pani, the wisdom that comes through re reflection, uh, which usually happens when you, you, know, you meditate uh, or observing in your daily life. You can see Dhamma proclaiming itself everywhere in the exter external world. Greed, hatred, and delusion is blaring from all the loudspeakers you know, in the world. Uh, and so, you know, everything the Buddha talked about can be confirmed that just watching people in, in situations out there on the street, you know, habits. Now they get in fights over clinging to their ideas about what is good, what is bad, you know, various theories, you know, all these conspiracy theories that are going on out there. So now all these are opportunities for reinforcing our you know, understanding of the Dhamma. Because when we understand how it's happening in us, then we understand how it's happening you know, in everybody else. And that's part of the, in the four foundations of mindfulness. When you read all those different sections of mindfulness, the Buddha says, you know, and he, he contemplates uh, the breathing internally. He, cons the breathing, cons uh, uh, he contemplates externally. And he contemplates both internally and externally. And people have described that in different ways. What is the meaning of that? But also feeling, he contemplates feelings internally, externally, mental states internally and externally. So we, we know what internally is, it means within ourselves. And what is external? Hmm? Right, in other people. When, when you see, see somebody with a strong greed in your it's in me too. And uh, so you, you contemplate it that, you know, that's universal, all those things are universal. You see a person experiencing a painful feeling. Because you know what a painful feeling is when you see somebody kind of grimacing and, you know, you assume you're not feeling that person's pain, but you assume they're experiencing pain. Uh, so it's kind of uh, intuitive. You're getting a message you can't hear. These robes weren't made for this. Uh, and the microphones, you know. Okay. Uh, So, again, uh, you know, in the, in the practice of meditation, this kind of uh, thinking about the Dhamma in this way is, you know, uh, part of the practice. You know, a lot of people, they talk about mindfulness and then they think it's just being mindful. They're talking about the, you know, very advanced level of mindfulness. But if you read the uh, sutta, like the four foundations of mindfulness, you know, like when the Buddha is talking about the five hindrances, he, you know, he says, uh, you know, the understand how does this hindrance arise? How does it continue? How does it cease? And how does it cease coming again in the future? And this is the, the same way he, he repeats that for almost every uh, section of the sutra. And so that involves some, you know, uh, thinking about it. And it's, uh, you know, it's part of that uh, chintamaya uh, panya to understand how those things came.
And how, especially how do they cease? And how do they cease? By stop repeating uh, them. And how do you stop repeating them? By seeing the transition from craving, grasping, and becoming. So this is how all these things are kind of woven together, you know, in the Dhamma. Everything that you read about in the Dhamma, it's kind of woven together. You know, the Buddha was a master in, you know, explaining, uh, you know, things uh, and how everything is connected. The Noble Eightfold Path are all connected to, uh, you know, the practice of meditation and almost everything that you see is connected. So in that, uh, you know, in the Paticca Samuppada, so the, every time you, you know, do a, an action, you know, that's motivated by greed, hatred, and delusion, you know, you strengthen the, the, the sense of, you know, I and, and self. And every time you kind of restrain from that, but the restraint has to become, has to come through the wisdom, uh, the, the right understanding. Then you weaken that sense of uh, self uh, until finally, you know, it dissolves. Now, as I mentioned last night or this morning, this technique of the Anicca Sanya. That's why this Anicca Sanya is a very specific technique and it's designed at directly uh, interfering with the process of craving, grasping, and becoming. <clears throat> because you speed up the, the rate of, what's called speeding up the rate of perception. It means when the, the sensory stimulations are coming through, we have already explained that. Uh, how normally, we, our mind is very dull, and so it, it clings on to those because that, that's how the mind it, it, it gets attracted to that. But and it doesn't have anything else to get attracted. So the mind's gonna to gravitate to the strongest kind of impulse that's coming through the senses. I mean, any time there's thousands of stimulations coming through the, the nervous system. And the mind usually grasps that strongest one, either it's the strongest desire or it's the strongest pain. It grasps uh, that. And everything else is kind of, uh, you know, um, blotted out. So that's why we have to provide more input that's more interesting than that strong impulse. Now, as I've already mentioned, if you're just meditating, you don't have much body feeling, and all of a sudden some, you know, strong itch arises or or some other pain, the mind naturally goes there. But if you've, you know, trained or maybe, you know, done some yoga and deep breathing at the beginning and you have a much more uh, powerful sense of, you know, sensations all over the body. And then when some particular pain or itch arises, you have some recourse to, to paying attention to uh, these other ones that are not so strong. And so all of your attention gets diluted from going to that stronger one. And it gives you the ability to endure that uh, stronger one until by itself, it changes or vanishes because of impermanence. So we don't, we don't normally give things a chance to be impermanent because we're so fast to rush and grab it. 
but in this way, we're giving it a little breathing room. And you'll see how, give it five, 10 seconds, it will usually either change or diminish its intensity so it's not so strong and therefore you can kind of, you know, uh, ignore it for a while and, and go on contemplating. So that's why when you open up to the flow of impermanence, and you have so and so many sounds. In fact, I wanted to ask you, uh, some of you, how many people during this morning's meditation, or, or the one at uh, you know nine o'clock or something like, uh, were able to hear sounds? You know, quite a lot number of sounds going on. Sounds are one of the best things for a Nietzsche. Apart from that furnace, okay, it's kind of just a monotonous ongoing sound, although it is changing. But there was a lot of, you know, bird chirps, right? And each one of those is arising and vanishing. You know? That's three arising and vanishing. And, or each syllable of my voice now is a arising and vanishing. Three, right there. Vanishing. Three. Now we say vanishing. Oh, what do you mean? No, just vanishing. Tune into the, the, the quick. That's what uh, brightens your mind. And so the same way with the, uh, the body. You know, we can feel sensations all over. You know, if, if you develop that ability to kind of hold that outline of the body and the mind, you'll see just, you know, George Bush's thousand points of light, you know, all over. From strong ones to even very subtle ones. And that becomes very, very interesting. You, you know, the mind becomes very concentrated. And so when something stronger comes, <clears throat> it's not felt in the same way. Because your, your attention is, is rooted over here and only part of it may go to the pain. Uh, and so it doesn't feel as bad as it would if you were not, you know, not having alternative sources of uh, attention. And so sounds, body sensations, uh, you know, you can f feel them alternating also. And if you have a pain in the, in the you're reacting to something in the body, Listen to a bunch of sound. And if you're bothered by the sound, then go feel something else in the body. But the idea is you, you, you keep the mind from clinging on to any particular one. So the past and the future of those objects is not uh, you know, brought up from the unconscious. And that's when the sense of I then starts to uh, expand. Because right now the, the I is basically a contraction of the mind. The mind contracts around an object. Me, that's bothering me, I want that. But when the mind is not doing that, it expands. Because the I isn't anything that's real like that anyway. And it can, it can expand out of itself or dissolve, as I gave the example. <clears throat> and so that's what we can directly, you can directly observe that process in the meditation. And that's how you understand anatta. That leads to anatta, the dissolution of the sense of self or I, I, me, and mine. I, me, and mine are the trinity of the ego. And every single thing that we uh, you know, experience, the mind relates to it either in terms of I, me, or mine. Just check up on it next time. In your mind, you relate how I want to go in there. I want to go. Me, me, they don't look at me. That's mine, that's mine, right? 
So that, that comes up every time. So, and that's because of the, you know, the, the focusing on particular objects. So that's why this is, it's a very skillful. And when I was first practicing this kind of meditation, that when I was sold on the, I said, God, the Buddha's got to be a genius to think about this Vipassana method. Gosh, Einstein don't even think of it. Well, maybe he does in a different way, but, you know. <clears throat> That's how I went beyond doubts. Uh, how the, the Buddha must have had to be enlightened to think up of a method like that. It's what I call the high tech. You know, you trick the mind out of itself. We've been tricked by Mara our whole life for many lifetimes. Now the Buddha devised a trick, how we can trick, trick Mara it's by developing this kind of, uh, you know, Vipassana uh, system, uh, method, the four foundations of mindfulness. And it's not different than the four foundations of mindfulness. Uh, this exact method is explained in the seven factors of enlightenment, which is part of the four foundations of mindfulness. Now, how many am I losing? How many people am I losing here? You haven't heard of these terms. Everybody heard of the four found uh, the seven factors of enlightenment. Anybody not? Anyway, uh, so, yeah. uh, so the four foundations of mindfulness, are mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of feeling, mindfulness of the mind states, and then mindfulness of the Dhamma. And these, the Buddha gave them in this order, explained them in this order, because that's the way of the natural development of it. And first, you have to get centered and grounded and kind of detached from, from uh, the body. And then when you have that concentration and grounded in the body, you clearly see the, the pleasant, painful uh, uh, feelings that are arising. And then the feelings are triggering the mind states. So you, 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 one leads to the other. Body leads to feelings. Feeling leads to mind states. And by that time, you've developed concentration probably up to the level of access concentration or the first jhana. You know. And then you start contemplating the, the, the Dhamma Nupasana, which starts with the five aggregates. Or no, it starts with the five hindrances. So you haven't attained jhana yet. You still got the hindrances. So going through mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of feelings, mind states, practicing mindfulness, not concentration, practicing mindfulness, you reach uh, that level of at least access concentration. And then you still have some hindrance. You contemplate those and you attain the first jhana. Then the mind becomes super clear. And you then the next stage is the five aggregates. You see how the five, you can only see the five aggregates clearly if you're in probably a jhanic level of, uh, uh, of awareness. I mean, seeing them really clearly. Uh, and then the six senses. And then the next stage is the seven factors of enlightenment. Because by that time, and it starts with investigation of Dhamma, which is mindfulness. But it's mindfulness that has that jhanic level of concentration behind it. And then investigation allows you to investigate. Vitaka and Vichara. And I'm sorry if I'm confusing people with the, you know, these terms. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but this, the seven factors of enlightenment is describing the Vipassana Pubangama, you know, Samadhi. That, it, uh, that mindfulness, investigation, joy. And then the sixth one is concentration. And that means the jhana or the fourth jhana. Even. And then equanimity. 
whose equanimity only arises in the third and fourth jhana. And so that equanimity of the seventh factor of enlightenment, the one's got, it was probably at least in the third or fourth jhana. And any time after that, one could, you know, enter the stream and so on. Again, I'm sorry if I'm, you know, uh, going a little bit over some of your heads. But uh, it's just to, to, to show how all these things are kind of fit together, the whole schematic of the, of the teaching and, and, the, and the practice of the meditation. And so one more uh, thing I just want, wanted to mention is that, you know, in the meditation, when we're contemplating the, the feelings that, you know, normally, you know, we don't see the feeling or, or the, the hearing, as I already mentioned, because we're uh, you know, focusing on the, the cause of that. Or let's say an emotion, okay? emotional state. So if, you, if anger arises, okay, you want to look directly at the anger. Observe the sensations in the body that the anger is producing. Maybe heat, maybe you're clenching your jaw, Maybe you're, you're fidgeting around, uh, you know, certain symptoms of anger, you know, that they produce in the body. So you observe that and just, you, you just know that, oh, this is anger. Yeah. That's kind of a yucky feeling. It's, it's not really a pleasant feeling. But most people don't do that because they're focusing on the object that caused their anger, isn't it? And when you focus on the object that caused your anger, you're going to increase your anger. But when you're focusing on just the anger itself or just the, the hearing itself, without focusing on the object that you regarded that had caused it, then uh, you will forget about it. Because we have anger, but you're no longer uh, attributing it to somebody who caused you anger. So therefore that anger would vanish very quickly. But only when you start thinking, yes, that person insulted me, they call, called me this, called me that. They tried to steal my job. Then that anger is gonna increase in me. But when you just observe the emotion itself, without going to the person or things that caused it, then there's no feedback. Because there's always a feedback happening between the, the feelings and the object that caused the feelings. And if you cut that feedback, the feeling vanishes because it's impermanent. Um, so these are, again, these are ways and things that you can apply when, you, you know, as you're meditating and, uh, you know, reflect on that one and, and then see how, how that works to you know, kind of help you, you know, detach from whatever is, you know, carrying your mind away. <clears throat> Does anybody uh, have any questions uh, regarding anything I was just uh, Okay, I know we went through a lot of things. About what I was just talking about? If it's about the talk, not if it's about something else. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, ask it at night. If it's a question that about something that I was just talking about, then he, he can ask it. But if it's some other question that uh, it should be asked at night, in the evening. What is the question? 
Tell him to ask it in the evening, otherwise if you're not curious. Okay, you can unmute yourself. David, ask your question. Anyway, so in your meditation, if you're still having trouble with wandering thoughts, then Think about these things that we, we talk about. Think about the Dhamma. Yeah, it's thinking, but at least it's thinking that's going to keep your mind focused in the meditation on what's happening, not some argument you had with somebody two weeks ago or whatever else it might be. So, you know, that's why that uh, discursive, uh, the discursive uh, thinking is, is a part of you know, it's called the anusati, the reflections. Uh, we're reflecting on it. But it's, it's reflecting on the dhamma that's occurring in the present moment. So therefore, it, it helps to get clarity you know, on it. So we have to substitute dhamma thinking for just erratic uh, thoughts of the past and future that because uh, in my fir the first retreat that I took in Nepal it was all about thinking a one month retreat my first retreat and it was thinking about the Dhamma thinking about the Four Noble Truths thinking about Pachichas Hamapada thinking about greed, hatred and delusion thinking about rebirth and karma and you know, one you know, at the beginning there was some kind of little breathing exercise, but that was just very short at the beginning, and most of it was thinking. We had to memorize big long lists and go over it in the mind. But that was super powerful because it's through that kind of thing that I had an experience that changed my life. Not gaining samadhi or jhana or anything else, although uh, when you're doing that kind of focused thought, you can attain even the first jhana with the kind of, you know, talk and vichara, if it's limited and focused. Uh, but yeah, so that's why that kind of, the right thought is, uh, you know, you can use that in meditation if you need it, you know, in order to overcome the things that are blocking your mind. That person, <laughs> what's with this? Yeah, I did. Oh, just forget about it. Afterwards, I write, write them down. Write them down for tonight. Okay. Oh, one more question. I did have a question. Um, I just want to make sure that I heard you correctly. That is a seven factors of enlightenment. The sixth one, which is concentration, it's really about the fourth jhana. Uh, it could be the third or fourth jhana. That's the way I would explain it, but others are going to argue and have their own opinions about it. But I would say at least the first jhana, because that's a definition of the concentration, right? First and fourth uh, jhana. But if you see how the development of it is, and you realize that equanimity only arises in the third and fourth jhana. So you would, you, you would kind of just assume that it means you would have had reached the, the third or fourth jhana by the end of, of all that. Because you should have reached the first jhana even at the very beginning. Uh, when the hindrances get suppressed. So that's the way, you know, I mean, all is intellectual, but you know the Dhamma is there for a reason. You know all the different things that you read about, but you have to know how to uh, use them. You know you have to to know how they they fit in to the puzzle. 
and what the Buddha is talking about in the, in the teachings and in the other things too. That, that way it makes it more sense. Otherwise, the mind can kind of get confused. Okay, uh, friends, I think. Uh, Equanimity. Okay. Yes, hi. Can I ask my question? Fire away. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's say I want to apply these uh, steps of analyzing the craving to the grasping to the becoming in the context of a major life decision where I want to change my career because I realize I've been grasping and becoming so much and now I see the suffering so I say I don't want to be a lawyer anymore I want to be a monastic uh, can I apply these these steps uh, also in a big major life um, decision, not just when I'm on the cushion to analyze some tension in my body? Uh, they can be applied to life situations uh, too. Let's say you're having a conversation with your partner or friend and then you, you, you start arguing about uh, you know, where you're going to go out to eat. You're grasping at your idea where you want to go out to eat. So you can see that, right? So you can apply it. Let go. Let the other person decide. Practice compassion. So in that instance, you can uh, reduce the, the becoming and the grasping on your idea where, which restaurant you want to go to. And, you know, so you don't get in an argument. So you can, you know, you know, otherwise you wind up getting an argument. That's just one example, but you can apply that in so many different situations, especially when you let go of your, you can see your mind grasping at the idea. The other person's grasping too, but they not be, might not be practicing Dhamma. So you have to take the lead. You're practicing Dhamma. You can't expect the other persons to be practicing Dhamma. So you have to take the lead and you have to get the initiative if you want to create you know, maintain some kind of harmony, especially if it's people you live with or your relatives and so on. Yes. You're going to see all of them. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let's uh, try to, uh, as we did yesterday, try to let go of all that outward focus, kind of just, just sit up a little bit, close your eyes. And feel your buttocks pressing the seat. Take a few deep, slow breaths. Hold the breath in for several seconds. Try to feel the body 